Hello and welcome to day 62 of the Income Stream. Today we're going to continue our five-part series about how to start a business from scratch. Yesterday we talked about specifically how riches are in the niches, how to find a particular group of people, how to talk to them, how to do research. And today we're going to go a little bit further into actually how to have conversations. When you have conversations and test and validate your ideas, what might you say? How might you initiate and position these conversations? What are you actually looking for? And then what do we do with that information so that we can move on to the next step? I'll do a more in-depth recap for those of you who are brand new today, and we're going to go uh, right into it. So welcome in. Thanks for being here. Say hello in the chat. And in the meantime, enjoy the intro. Anyway, this is the income stream to help you achieve your dream. All while we keep it clean, this is the income stream. It's the kind of show where you can come and go, but then you leave inspired with no fee required. The income stream with Pat Flynn. And you know what? That's a good, I like that. I like that that happened because you know what? When you start a business, things might not fire off the way you want to right in the beginning. And it's your ability as a human being to adapt that makes this work, right? And that's what makes this great, the ability to adapt. And for those of you who don't know, I was laid off in 2008. I was supposed to be an architect. That's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And then all of a sudden, June 17th, 2008 rolls by, I get laid off. And I didn't realize that I always had the ability to adapt. I always was so focused on the things that I couldn't control. And I wanted to start those uh, and, and it wasn't until I started thinking about the things I could control that things started to happen. And for those of you who want to start a business, that's the first thing you have to do. You have to mentally understand that this is possible. Now, there's a number of ways to help yourself understand that. Number one, it's easier to say, well, it's easier said than done, right? The, 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 that's lesson number one. However, you have to tell yourself that this is possible because the more that you say something, the more you're going to believe it, whether or not that thing is actually true. So if you always tell yourself that this thing is impossible, guess what? It's probably going to be impossible. I think it was Henry Ford who said, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. So we need to believe that this can happen. How might you believe that this happens? Well, you might find somebody else who's paved the way in front of you. And that's kind of why I'm here because I've done this before. I've gone through this myself. If you've recently been laid off or let go, well, hopefully I'm like that guy with the machete who's paved the way for you so that the trail is a little bit easier for you and I can help make those mistakes. I can help sort of get all the scratches and bumps and bruises so that you don't have to as well. Now, I'm not going to say that along the trail, you might scratch yourself on some bushes. You might encounter a mountain lion and hopefully be able to escape. But we're all in this together, and I think I think that's why that this is absolutely important. Secondly, um, you know, having conversations with people, which is what the theme is today, what, what part two is about in terms of having uh, just start a business, is, is absolutely important because a lot of times when it comes to building a business, it can be a very tough and very big thing that you're trying to do and oftentimes it's brand new something you've never done before and as a result you you almost look for and try to validate why this is not going to work for you but i want you to start reframing your mindset and the stories in your brain to be the other thing how or where might we find hints that this is actually going to work so i can continue to move forward and these conversations are really important in fact um, before i go a little bit further let's recap what we talked about yesterday if you remember yesterday here's what we talked about we talked about number one, riches in the niches. And the fact that we don't have to create a blockbuster hit in order to create something massively life-changing and massively successful. When I built my architecture exam website, it was about an architectural exam called the LEAD exam, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And unfortunately, it wasn't a huge one. So I always thought that even if I were to succeed in that space, it wouldn't do very well. But the opposite was actually true. In fact, because it was so niched, it was a lot easier for me to compete with other people who are also teaching all kinds of different things. So it was sort of like a specialty. However, I wasn't the first to teach people how to pass an architectural exam. I was the first to step up and teach that one. But because it was so small, I think that's why a lot of people almost avoided it. But because of that, I was very much seen as an authority much quicker. 
Because of that, I was able to connect and find those people much sooner. They were all in different forums and different architecture websites in their own little space. And yes, it was the least popular part of that forum, but I went in there and answered questions and I was in there eight to 10 hours a day trying to do whatever I could to become the expert. And I was seen as the expert because I was showing up so much. And then number three, it was easier for Google to place my stuff higher than other people who were talking about it just sort of on the side. And it was because it was my main thing. That's what helped me jump in front of everybody. And that's how I was able to succeed after starting a uh, product. I wrote a ebook study guide to help pass people uh, pa to help people pass that exam. And it was simply a PDF file that was sold through a tool called eJunkie. And that tool just made it very simple for uh, everybody to to get access to that and make it happen. Cool. Energy follows thought. Absolutely. Before we go further, let's welcome in everybody. We got Corey in the house. What's up? We got Zinya and Vlada with uh, BS with Becca. We also got April in the house. Thank you so much for joining me. We got Felix Galaba. We got Just Samson, Aaron, Mountain Lion, Adobo. <laughs> yeah, you can go and make that and eat it maybe. Uh, Deanna says, hey, everyone. What's up, Deanna? Great to see you here. Barry in the house. Margaret, Simply Obs. We also got Mary to Michael Mann with the $5 super chat. Paying forward what I take in for my business during this pandemic. Gave away 15% of my tax refund. That's awesome, Michael. Thank you so much. And thank you for the donation. Donations that come in this month are going to Project Cure, who is helping people, uh, who are helping people on the front lines in the medical field right now. Last month, we donated 6,000 meals to people in San Diego through the San Diego Food Bank, which is really great. And I expect us to uh, have even a bigger impact this month. So thank you all. Uh, for everybody who has left a super chat so far this month. Not required, no fee required, as the song says. And again, I don't know what happened to my intro. Wait, let me try that one more time and see if it actually fires through. That was super weird. It just paused. Does not want to play. I might have to update something. I don't know. I hadn't I hadn't turned off the computer in a while. It's always good to turn off and then turn on your computer daily, hopefully. But I promise I don't do that all the time like I like I just said you should. Do any of you keep your computer on like all the time? I should probably turn it off more. But anyway, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we also talked yesterday about a couple things in terms of some things that you can actually execute on. Number two, we talked specifically about the 777 exercise. That was where we would come up with our seeds for our ideas. Not necessarily, hey, let's come up with 21 ideas and pick one of them to build a business about. That's not what it's about. It's about starting small with a seed and then diving further into that space using what's called a market map. So the 777 exercise, choosing seven problems, seven passions, seven fears, writing them out just so you can see them, lay them out on the table. And you can start removing them, start creating patterns, start circling the ones that are interesting. And the ones that you keep, you move on to the next step, which is number three, which is the market map. And if you might remember the market map, this is where you find the three P's of your audience, the places where that particular seed idea audience exists, the th uh, people who have already earned the trust with that particular audience, and number three, the products that are already being served uh, and, and servicing that audience. And that's really great because that market map alone will help you, much like a map does in real life, understand where to go or where not to go or whether or not you want to actually land your plane there or move on to somewhere else. And then you can make a decision to move forward. And the idea is if in the 777 exercise you have more than one idea, run through the market map exercise with each so that you can get a better understanding and have a more informed decision before you choose one to move forward with. And yes, you're getting another green light, but it's not exactly your business idea yet because you don't yet understand the exact problems in the exact language that your target audience is going through. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. How do we actually have conversations with people? How do we understand what they might need help with exactly? They may be saying one thing, but what do they actually need to solve that problem? And what language are they using to describe that problem. That's very important too. That's often overlooked in entrepreneurship because that language is key. That's how you connect with your prospects. That's how you connect with the customer on the other end. We see a super chat coming in from Nick Fans TV. Hey Pat, any insight or resources on creating market research survey for your audience in order to be more targeted when pursuing brand deals? Uh, that's a great question. So you might have an audience already and you might want a survey. That's sort of the best case scenario because you've already built this audience perhaps within a specific or more general market. And you can go in there to get specific to understand what they might need help with. We've run surveys in the past in my audience and we've used a tool called SurveyMonkey. Although you don't necessarily need a tool like that to get into the deep and data analytics, you can just simply use email and send emails that ask a couple questions. You can encourage people to fill out those surveys 
or reply to the email in exchange for, you know, some giveaway of some kind or a $5 Amazon gift card uh, given to somebody at random. It doesn't have to be much in order to encourage people to follow through, right? So on the survey, yes, collecting demographical data can be really interesting, although you could likely get a lot of that information just based on user data from places like YouTube or Google Analytics or what have you, if you, again, have that audience already. But to take it one step further, I always prefer to collect open-ended or answers to open-ended questions. My favorite question is, what's the number one challenge you have related to blank? And I gotta give credit to where credit is due. That comes from a book called Ask by Ryan Levesque. And that book changed everything in my business in terms of helping myself and my team understand more about who was in my audience and then how we could better serve them. In fact, it was the data and the um, collection of that survey and those answers that determined the different buckets in our audience that we started reaching out to and creating for and creating products for and uh, building segments of our email list for. And whenever I create a piece of content, I consider, is it a bucket one piece of content, a bucket two or bucket three? And that came from that exact question. What's your number one challenge related to blank or online business in my case? And seeing patterns in the answers that come back is really key. But the language is really important, like I was saying, because the better you can understand not just the problems that your target audience has, but how they describe those problems, the better it is that you're gonna be able to connect with them in the future when somebody opens an email or sees a subject line or reads a blog post or sees that sales page for that product. Or in a conversation, you can relay back the same thing and they're gonna understand that you understand what they're going through. It was Jay Abraham who said, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, they will automatically assume you have the solution, right? Thank you for that Super Chat Knicks fan, appreciate you. We got one from Don coming in, $10. Thank you for generosity. Thank you for your generosity. I appreciate you today. Where are we going today on the mugs in Starbucks? We are going to Lisboa or Lisbon, which is all the way up in um, Portugal. Beautiful country, by the way. That was the first time, this was two years ago, I spoke at um, in Lisbon at the Digital Nomad Conference and it was the first time I ever stepped foot in Europe. And it was such an amazing experience. Got to meet a lot of people. Got to see the architecture that I once studied in school. And it was so trippy to see like architecture that I studied in school for a totally different career, but now be there to speak about online business and teaching people about how to make money and how to be uh, digital nomads and affiliate marketing and all that stuff, which was really cool. Star mugs, that's right. Let's see, ooh, this is a good idea from just Samson. Need a Pat Flynn book club day. Yeah, we got a lot of good books. In fact, here's one that's at my grasp by a girl, a woman named Mel Melanie, sorry, not girl. Um, and the Content Fuel Framework. This is a really good, uh, this is a really good read for content creation. In case you wanna check this out, Melanie Desiel. And uh, definitely recommend I, uh, you check this out. I had dinner with her at Social Media Marketing World back when we were able to actually have dinner with other people in person how to generate unlimited story ideas. So if you're a content creator, this is a really good framework, highly recommended. Cool. Hasta la vista boss says, how do you avoid repeating yourself, Pat, and stop rumbling? Well, I'm not perfect. I still feel like I rumble every once in a while, but what helps me really is to understand, okay, well, what's the next point and start fresh with that? Or what's the next story that I'm going to tell and start fresh with that? That's how I sort of progress moving forward over time here in the chat. So for example, I have an outline in front of me of where I wanna go. This is sort of the roadmap for today on a post-it note. It says, number one, the importance of conversation, which we're getting into right now. Number two, then the mistakes of holding your ideas secret, right? Because it's very interesting. A lot of people are afraid to share their ideas and have conversations, real authentic ones with potential target audience members because we're worried that people are gonna steal our idea. And I wanna talk about that. Number three, how to initiate and position these conversations. Number four, what to say or ask. And number five, what exactly are you looking for? And we've breezed over and, and sort of covered a lot of these things sort of in general, but I wanna get it more into the specifics right now. But to your question, Hasta La Vista boss is just practice, honestly. Practice and knowing where I wanna go, right? This is the same analogy of if you're driving to some location, if you don't know what location is, you're likely gonna go in circles and come across the same street. And you'll be like, hey, I remember seeing that tree or hey, I saw that dog not too long ago. I don't even know where I'm going. So when you know where you're going, you're gonna avoid that possibility of, of rambling. And, 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 and also just if there's a point to the conversation, you wanna make sure you deliver on that point. Um, 
But the best advice I can give you is just practice, right? Practice. I podcast for a living, right? So I've been having a lot of conversations with myself where I have to not ramble and I have to record. And I promise you, it's not perfect. I still say um quite a bit. In fact, there should be an um counter here on the chat. I think that would be a really interesting thing to help myself improve. This is much like Toastmasters, right? Toastmasters is an organization that you can go to back when you could meet in person, but you would learn and train how to speak in front of other people. And in fact, when it was your turn to speak, there would be people who would keep track of your pauses, your ums, and filler noises. And filler words are things like um or uh or but uh, I say that a lot, but uh, and that reminds me of How I Met Your Mother. You remember How I Met Your Mother? But uh, and they would play like a drinking game when Robin, who was a news anchor, would ever, whenever she said but um, and they would uh, they would they would take a drink. Uh, at Reef, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate that. Hey, Archer also sent one earlier too. Thank you, my friend. Project Kickstart from Brian Bennett. Hashtag Asana Tips. Love it. Says. Pat, walking in your footsteps gives me so much more confidence. Would you be okay sharing who did your Income Stream Music logo? Yeah, absolutely. So got to give credit to where credit is due. Let me write out these names here so you'll have them clearly in front of you. So the music came from... Whoa, I'm drawing on a hidden layer. We don't want to do that. Music came from music... This is a little bit too big. Music, radio, creative... Dot com. That's Mike and Isabella. They're awesome. So Music Radio Creative. And the logo and the intro, which isn't working today for some reason, comes from a man named Austin Sailor. S-A-Y-L-O-R. Check him out. He does my animations and also um, helps me animate my logos for my courses, which is really cool. So I can pop them into intro videos and things like that. Who said I don't say um often and I never noticed it? Jennifer says, you don't say um often at all. I do say um, but I breeze through it. I try not to pause so much on it. And now that we're talking about it, you're probably listening for it. And because we're talking about it and it's the topic, I'm not, and I'm purposefully not adding it in. One of the best things that I learned is if you feel like you have to fill in that time with something, you don't. When you say um, it's essentially just you thinking and you kind of have to train yourself out of, I should probably do an entire series about public speaking in the future. Maybe we can do that next week. Would that be interesting if next week's theme, because I've been attempting to and trying these five-part series now so that we can sort of like start on Monday, finish on Friday, and then Saturday and Sunday are more fun and games and website reviews and YouTube channel reviews and things like that. I think maybe next week we can start about, we can talk about speaking and public speaking because I think whether you are a podcaster or a video person or public speaking in the future, I know that's something that a lot of you aspire to do. That could be really interesting. And I have a lot of thoughts on that. In fact, it's one of my favorite topics that I don't teach about. And I've fallen in love with the craft and the art. I've learned a lot. I've spoken in front of hundreds of thousands of people, not all at once, but cumulatively. Um, I think that'll be a good conversation. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the series. Yes. Good idea. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you for helping me crowdsource that. Let's not delay any longer. Let me tell you a quick story. Story time, y'all. So the year was about 2010. I had my podcast up for not too long, but I was gaining a rather larger audience, mostly from the blog. A lot of traffic was coming over. I was becoming known for my income reports and such. And I was really excited to take a lot of the money that was coming and invest it elsewhere. And I had an idea because two of my friends had just recently published WordPress plugins, premium WordPress plugins. W WordPress is a blogging platform and typically these plugins that you can put in to customize your stuff on your website are free. However, there was this movement going on of people creating really high-end WordPress plugins that did some really amazing things and interesting things. Um, things that would be a lot harder to code that was worth people's money because it saved them time, saved them a lot of time. So, two of my friends within two weeks published their own WordPress plugins and each made over $100,000 within a week after their launch. And they, they, they weren't competing against each other. They didn't even really know each other. It just so happened that they were doing this right around the same time. And I was blown away. Plus the fact that I was comparing the size of my audience who felt who, who, who fell in the same realm in terms of who their audiences were, I had a much bigger audience. And I said, oh my gosh, like I had dollar signs coming out of my face, out of my eyes. And I said, there's a huge opportunity here. If I were to create a premium WordPress plugin and sell it to my audience, this could be my first product. 
this could be something that could drive revenue through the roof. I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm actually gonna create a WordPress plugin. So here's what we did, or here's what I did. I found a developer simply through a Google search because I was so, I was like, I need to do this fast because this opportunity is really big, right? So I found a developer on Google. I reached out to them and I said, I'd love for you to help me develop a WordPress plugin. Are you available for hire? And they were like, yeah, we, we do this. Here are some examples. And I was really impressed. I was like, okay, cool. So I signed a deal contract. It was gonna take six weeks to develop this idea that I had in my head. I just came up with it sort of on the fly. And because I really wanted this to happen, that was mistake number one. I did it for the purpose of just making money. I didn't even have a fully fleshed out idea. You'll hear some of the other bigger lessons here at the end of the story. But I hired this developer. It was gonna take six weeks for $6,000. This project ended up taking six months in over $15,000 because there was a ton of back and forth. And again, it was simply because I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to create. All I knew was I wanted to sell a WordPress plugin. Huge mistake. I should have just like, man, if I can go back in the future, I'd be like, yo, Pat, Bruh. what are you doing, man? You're just here to make money? Like, that's not what you're supposed to do. That was one of the first lessons that I learned. It was a $15,000 lesson that taught me that your earnings are a byproduct of how well you serve your audience. Well, let me continue the story here. I didn't tell anybody about this plugin because I wanted to keep it secret. I wanted to unveil it on a big grand event like situation to my audience. And I was building my email list finally. I was I was posting consistently online. I had my podcast. I was like, okay, when I come out with this plugin and when it's perfect, I'm gonna share it with everybody. Well, it took a lot longer than I thought. And again, part of that was because I didn't really know what I wanted. And that was not to no fault of the developer, but I, I kept blaming the developer for not creating the thing the way I wanted it to, but how is this person supposed to know? Because I couldn't articulate it myself. So that was mistake number number two, it was just not, if you're developing something, especially a software, you need a wireframe it. you need to have very clear instructions so that your developer will have no room for freedom. You need to be the person who tells the, the developer exactly what you want to happen. Well, anyway, we finally, after six months, got this idea fleshed out and I was satisfied with it. I was like, okay, I'm gonna sell it for probably $99 and you know, I was making predictions of how well it would go. And so what I did was I eventually got a few of my friends together who were in the online space as well, including these other two plugin guys, and I shared it with them. And this was a week before launch, the week before I was gonna make this big announcement. Again, ha haven't ever mentioned it to any anybody else. And here was the reaction from my friends and my colleagues who had experience in this space. Uh, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. And I was like, what do you mean it's okay? It does this, this, and this. And then they get, oh, well, yeah, there's another plugin that kind of does that too. And it does this too. But hey, Pat, maybe if you had some more time, you could do this instead. Or Pat, maybe if you do this to it. Oh yeah, this is a great idea, but I think you could take it a little bit further going this way. Uh, I don't know if this is a good idea. I wouldn't sell it myself. Um, I would actually start over if I were you. And I was like so distraught. I was so like gut punch from the situation that I actually ended up not launching it at all. So that was $15,000 down the hole. Although it was a very important lesson, one that I'm thankful now looking back that I was able to go through because it taught me a number of, of things. Number one, don't chase the money ever. The money should be a part of the situation, but that should not be the primary goal. Your primary goal is to help other people first, which is what we talked about yesterday. Your earnings are a byproduct of how well you serve your audience. Number two, this idea was forced because of the money, but because I didn't even spend the time to consider what a person would actually want to use because I kept it so secret, well, that ended up biting me in the foot or, or shooting myself in the foot because of that. And number three, because I didn't share it with anybody ahead of time and I spent the time to build that business first, I lost out on so many opportunities to make it even better. And this is why I recommend that if you have an idea this goes counterintuitive to what a lot of people assume. I would recommend sharing it with people up front. Yes, you want, want to share it with people who you perhaps trust, but there's as much as possible. But I still recommend sharing it with prospects. I even, you know, with any of my new business ideas, I try to look for strangers who don't know about me because I don't want a biased opinion. Oh yeah, Pat, yeah, you'll do great. Like everything you touch turns into gold. And I'm like, no, I want people's real, honest, authentic feedback on things that I'm working on. And I'm willing to take the risk of having somebody else take that idea in exchange for way more things that are much more positive as a result of that. I am able to see and, and get a feel for the gut reaction of that idea from a person who may or may not be in that target audience. I might be able to have people ask questions to clarify 
wouldn't it make sense to have people tell you this is a bad idea up front or ask questions like, well, I don't quite understand. What do you mean by that? And if I don't know how to answer, well, how in the, how in the world am I going to understand how to build this thing or create it or even sell it? So I prefer to have people poke holes in my ideas up front. This is very uh, similar to the switch pod, right? So the switch pod, when we came up with this switch pod idea, right? Question is one that I have to, okay, cool. Thank you. If you can repost that question, I don't know if I could find it. Gino, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate you. I'm gonna go and find some, okay, so Grandma Goody, okay, I got your question, thank you. I'm gonna get into this in just a minute. But with the switch pod, this was, and actually you'll see there's a, this isn't mine up top. This is a Woo Hot. This is a Woo Hot sort of adapter for a phone. This ball head here is something that came later. This was product number two for the switch pod. We sold a thousand of these in one day. How do we know? Because we actually asked people and told people ahead of time that these were coming. But this is the switch pod here. It's a tripod vlogging apparatus that allows you to switch from tripod mode to vlogging mode in just a snap. Pretty cool. And how was this built? This was built as a result of sharing the idea up front with YouTubers who were struggling with their Gorilla Pods, asking them what they would like, what they didn't like. We gave them prototypes. We put it in their hands and go, go with it. Let me know what you think. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Too big, too small? What would you like to see instead? How much would you pay for this thing? And all along the way, this was shaped and this became what it is as a result of the conversations that we had with people ahead of time. And I'm so thankful to the entire YouTube community who was at Vid Summit. Uh, both times we went where we shared different prototypes. I also brought the prototype to Craft and Commerce, which is an event put on by an email service provider I advise called ConvertKit. And I spoke at that event. That's where I met Casey Neistat and I shared this with him. I went to an event called Vid Summit. I met Peter McKinnon, but also the, you know, regular creators, the, the people who aren't sort of at the top of their game, they were actually even more interested and more excited to, to, pro, to provide feedback and wanting to follow up. And while collecting feedback so that I can shape this thing in the way that I wanted to with me and Caleb doing it, it wasn't just me, but we were also, guess what? Seeding the idea that this thing was something we were working on and existing. So by the time it came out, everybody, including those at SPI who I've shared videos with and have shared blog posts with about the process, everything we're learning, everything that we're doing. We're essentially letting people in on the process so that by the time this thing comes out, everybody knows it exists already. It's not a surprise. And in fact, the idea of using your work in public to share that this thing is coming out is a very smart idea because then the marketing sort of just takes care of itself. Like when I've written my books, I've let people know that I'm writing a book or what chapters I've just finished and, and et cetera. Superfans was a very publicly written book. It was written in November of 2018 during NaNoWriMo, which is a month that authors use as an excuse to write 50,000 words within 30 days. I was able to finish Superfans in about 36 days, uh, finishing on my birthday on December 6th, which was really interesting. And then that book became Superfans, which launched at FlynnCon in July of 2019. And so because people knew this book existed, they were a part of the process with me, it was very easy for them to see and, and get behind it and get involved and even be a part of the process. And when you can get your audience involved, they're gonna be invested. So the, this is why these conversations are really key. Okay, so that was a huge mistake. If I could take it back, well, honestly, I wouldn't because it becomes a great story I can pass on to you. And it was a wise investment uh, in my future in learning the proper way to build a business. Don't hold these things secret. Number two, don't build just for the money. And number three, try to have people poke holes in it as much as possible so that you can make this thing better by the time it comes out. Okay, so answering a couple questions here as we go. Grandma Goody says, question, what if I realized I didn't lay the foundation, no 77 people, products, places, but raced ahead, how to balance going forward or back? This is a great question. So the 777 exercise is really great because it allows you to, to know that these ideas come from you. And that's really important because if you just simply, if somebody threw a business idea in front of you and it was like how to, you know, uh, how, to, how, to, how to raise night crawlers or worms in your backyard and sell them online. Like, let's say there was a huge business opportunity there, like even, even millions of dollars and you could create a, an earthworm farm in your backyard or a nightcrawler farm that you could sell to bass and pro shops and fishing shops locally and online. Like if there was a huge business there and that was just somebody's idea that they gave to you and you weren't really interested in it, but you took that idea because there was money involved, likely, and this is very common, I see people going into businesses that 
they necessarily they don't necessarily have passion about and they always burn out. they always do eventually they will burn out so you must have some sort of connection to what it is that you're getting into now perhaps you've chosen something grandma goody that you are uh, interested in, in already and likely in, and in many cases that just happens automatically you didn't start with necessarily a framework or 777 exercise like we talked about but maybe in some way shape or form it came from you in which case well it would have done the job anyway and you're probably okay but if you are in a space and you actually step back and rewind and go wow I actually am not enjoying myself here you need to find something that you do enjoy about it find somewhere that you can actually enjoy the process because if you don't enjoy that or you enjoy you don't enjoy the people or the space or the industry that you're in you're going to get burnt out money like doing it just for the money will only take you so far because as we all know a lot of people who win the lottery they're they're at the most unhappiest time in their life a lot of people who finally get the riches that they want actually realize that it's not the money that would uh, make them happy in the in, you know in, to, to begin with uh, but they realize that later. So I think a lot of business owners realize that when they get into businesses and industries that they're just not fans of or interested in. But there may be a way to do this. What part of what you're doing do you love? How might you do that more? And what can you hand off for the other things? So maybe it is earthworms and night crawlers. I don't know why I chose that niche, but maybe that's something you love doing. And the part about it that you love are the partnerships and the, and the relationships that you create with other fishing spots because you just so happen to like fishing and you sort of, that's what you do. You focus on the relationship building with those Bass Pro Shops and you become sort of a, a, a supplier for them. And that's really cool. That's the part you focus on. You hire out everything else, right? You don't want to touch worms. And, 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 and you even hire people locally around you who have nice dirt in their backyard to help supply these worms for you and you give them a little bit of cash and you like, you like supporting those families too. I don't know, I'm just trying to find some way that you can enjoy this process and what it is that you're doing. Gino says, thanks for all you do for your community and the world. I'm grateful for your story and sharing your world with us from Gino. Thank you, Gino, I appreciate you. Purposefully, in, uh, purposefully inspired team, love it. Thank you so much. We got Coach Deb in the house. We got Earn. We got Sarah Dawn. Awesome. Who's who's doing knitting stuff? Dawn says, "What tool plugin widget would you? Uh, what tool plugin widget do you use to house your podcast on your website? Looking for something to give clips of songs from Music Project. So you know, hosting your podcast is one thing, and I use Buzzsprout, um, which is really cool." Not sponsoring today's show, but I do want to give them a shout out, in fact. And the reason why is because these microphones that we've been giving away, they're sold out like everywhere. So we're going to put a pause on the Buzzsprout sponsorship. Big shout out to them. If you still want to go through them and you get 33% more time on your hosting account, you can go to my link, smartpassiveincome.com slash Buzzsprout. That's a free one for you there because you're so awesome. But when it comes to sharing clips, you could do a couple of things. You can use tools like... Uh, repurpose.io or wave with two v's w-a-v-v-e dot co i think it is uh, or io uh, there's a lot of websites where you can actually get and place audio clips using a video and it's just a video embed versus a, an audio embed however if you just want to make it simple you could use something like the Fusebox player formerly known as the smart podcast player where if you just you can just upload an mp3 to, to Dropbox or to Amazon S3 or even your server on your website, and you can have the player call that instead if, if you just wanted to play a clip versus on your host, it's going to be your full episodes unless you had a specific secondary feed just for your clips, which is a possibility. There are, are a lot of people in the YouTube space who do that. They take these full podcast episodes and video, and then they have a separate channel just for the clips. GRE does that, Joe Rogan Experience, Chris D'Elia does that. Um, clips for the babies is what that's called. He calls his audience babies, right? What's up, my babies? Love Chris Celia. Anthony says, is the same idea of focus group research for any business idea? It's similar, except I don't like those focus group things where you're sort of like you place people in a box and you're like, hey, look at this product. We don't even know what the product is yet, right? The focus here is to have conversations so we can better understand and empathize with our audience. That's the whole point of these conversations and today's conversation here. This is the part to date, part two of this whole business building process that we're talking about this week. Make sure you subscribe so you can get the rest of the parts. Watch part one if you haven't already. It's there on the feed. Um, this is the most overlooked part of business. Uh, as I did back in 2010 with my WordPress plugins and several other business ideas that I had started and stopped in the past, it was because I couldn't get in contact or I didn't contact and couldn't empathize with who I was speaking to. 
If you're starting a business, wouldn't it make sense to have conversations with those who you're building a business for? However, how many times do we, and maybe you can admit to this too, start something without even have, having any point of contact with those who we are serving? We expect that when we build the blog, that the people will come. We expect that when we build the YouTube channel or we create the business or the online course or the coaching program, that it's just going to work or hope we just cross our fingers that it's going to work versus what if you had a conversation even with two or three people who you were targeting and you found that they each had or had some sort of common problem that you could build a very specific solution for. They're gonna be more likely to be interested in what the solution is because number one, yes, you would have built a relationship, but number two, you're speaking their language. It's built specifically for them. Number three, when you build it, you can empathize better, right? You can understand what they're going through, the real life stories. It's not some made up avatar. In fact, I don't like the avatar exercise. It's okay. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about that exercise where it's like, Come up with a name and a, and a story for your made-up avatar, right? Your your ideal customers, I often say. Uh, his name is, uh, you know, John. He is 36 years old. He is a family that's very young, and he's working 9 to 5, but he doesn't like his job, so he listens to podcasts to try and get inspired to, you know, start something new, and that's cool, right? Because you can imagine, John, if you're creating podcasts or creating a product, you can be like, okay, John, yeah, you have a family. I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to try and write a little bit better because I know who you are. But then what if you had questions? You're like, John, do you like this? You're like, I don't know, this is a made up person. I like speaking to real people because then you can actually ask them real questions. Like, well, tell me more about that problem or what have you done to try and solve that problem before and what, what do you, why didn't it work out or how much of a pain is this for you? And well, what if I created this? Would this be something that you'd be interested in? Or, hey, I have an idea. You know, if I put this all in an online course, would that even be something that you'd be interested in? And then you can get real life feedback as you go with people who see that you're trying to help them. And thus you can build something and validate it up front without wasting your time and money, which is the whole purpose of my book, Will It Fly? And the whole purpose of a course that you can actually get for free. It's usually something you have to pay for, but we've made it free during this pandemic. If you go to smartpassiveincome.com slash toolkit, thanks for the super chat, Rafal. You go to this page here where you can get access to my course smart from scratch and currently this is uh something that is free we've given away over three million dollars worth of that course by the way so you can get access to it for free you can go through this process i'm actually during this week sort of going through a lot of the components and the more struggle moments in that course for people that that we found over the last couple of years which is why we're going deep into part two here because this is like i said the thing that's most often overlooked so we talked about the importance of having these conversations to understand more about these people, to understand who it is we're serving and whether or not that's something we wanna to continue to do, getting a green light to move on to the next step, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, number two, we've talked about the mistake of holding it secret if you were to keep your ideas secret. And again, I know what you're thinking. What if this person steals my idea? Number one, that's always gonna be a possibility. People could steal it now, they could steal it later. Number two, you have to realize that, well, you're the one who is putting the focus and effort in, into creating this. So even though a person that you speak to might go, ooh, I like that idea. I think I'd like to do something too. Chances are they're likely not going to step up and do it because you are in the process of doing it and you obviously know how hard it is. Now you wanna be careful about who you speak to. You wanna talk to people who you could trust and it's ran it's not gonna be likely that some random stranger is gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna create that idea too and they could sabotage your work. Plus you putting yourself into this is going to help it stand out from anybody else who competes with you, right? This is how the switch pod's able to compete. And honestly, even if somebody were to rip this off, number one, we have a patent. Number two, um, we have the audience. We have the connection with our people that will take us further than anybody else could if somebody were to rip us off and build a competing product. Um, it's a connection with the audience. And the fact that we've had you know hundreds, if not thousands of conversations with people, they, they know why we're doing what we're doing. And that's something that nobody else can compete with, right? So that's, num that's number two. Um, next, how might we initiate these conversations? This is one of the hardest things. And in fact, before we get to that, I wanna give a couple shout outs and thank yous. We have a super chat coming in from Rafal. Thank you, Rafal, I appreciate you, my friend, for being here today. Looking for some more questions here too. Question from Dole Whip Dad, 15K in cost, did you consider launching it even with its issues? If not, why not? Were you not happy with the end result? I was satisfied with the end result of this WordPress plugin that I created. 15K is an investment. However, I know that I am in, in of service to you. 
And if I were to launch something just because I thought it was good, but it's not great. And again, I got finally got validation uh, from friends and I even had further conversations with people in my audience who were super fans who I shared it with, who agreed with them. So I did confirm and it wasn't like my friends were like, no, don't do it. And then I was like, okay, fine, I'll listen to you. I mean, it was a 15K investment. So of course I wanted to make sure it was something that, you know, if I was gonna shelve it was the right decision and it was the right decision. And I did consider it still, but I knew that it wasn't the best move. In fact, it would have come across, especially to my audience who I knew was very transparent with me like I was with them, it, it wouldn't have come across very well and it it wouldn't serve my audience the best way possible. So I, I shelved it. Uh, Suzanne says, were you not afraid someone would steal your idea, Pat? I was afraid before, but now, I know that if somebody else wants to compete with me, I know that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do more work and more research to make this even better than them if they wanted to do it. But like I keep saying, there are so many more benefits of sharing your idea. I'm not gonna say that your idea will never be stolen, but I would much rather, ha um, I would much rather share my idea and have somebody tell me it's 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 a bad idea or what the holes are or what I could do to make it better so that even if somebody else were to take that idea, I would have all that insight and that information because I promise you they're not gonna do as much as much research. Great idea to reverse engineer an issue to provide a product to solve a problem. That's really what it's about, right? Any great business, any great product, digital, physical, is all about solving a pain or a problem, right? Now, there are other kinds of business models that can come out of this situation too. You might have conversations with a group of people based on your seed ideas and where you end up and what niche you're in. And you might find that, well, you can't necessarily create a product right now, but you can definitely build an audience and find more people like those initial people that you spoke to to try and come up with something later, right? So a lot of people go through Smart From Scratch and the purpose of Smart From Scratch, the promise is you can, using that information, uh, pre-sell your first product, you know, get your first customer even before you create the thing. But a lot of people are still not comfortable doing that or don't have an idea worth selling yet or pitching, in which case they go, okay, well, I've done enough research in this space now, I can come up with all kinds of different content to help this audience build up a bigger audience and then have more people to connect with to perhaps create something in the future. So you might take the route of building an audience, in which case it's gonna take a little bit longer to get to the point where you can make money, but you can build this audience and raving fans and an email list uh, to a point where you can then serve them later with something, or you might big that, uh, build that audience big enough where you can attract advertisers, where you're not necessarily making money from that audience, but you are making money because of that audience. And there's a big difference there. And that's where you can get advertisers involved. However, it takes a little bit more time. It takes some volume on your end too. And that's really key. How do these, so we're, how are we 45 minutes in y'all? That's, Bruh. doesn't it, does any, for any of you, does the time go by so fast that you're just kind of, how in the world did an hour go by? I mean, we're, we're 43 minutes into this already. And I just, I'm always amazed. Thank you. Let's see. Question, thank you, Samson, for bringing this to light. Do you recommend keeping all of your raw footage or just finished videos? Thanks for everything. Uh, well, this is in regards to, you know, creation for YouTube and podcasts and such. Um, I, I do keep them, but I keep them in an external drive just in case I wanna go back or pull those edits or, 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 or redo the video, update, sort of components of it. I do keep them just in case. Love this from Coach Deb in Rap and Combat. People will forget the words you shared, but they'll never forget how you made them feel, for sure. All right, let's keep going. Time passes by quickly here, really fast, goes unbelievably fast. Yeah, isn't it crazy? What are you guys doing, by the way, while watching? Are you literally like at your desk watching me or are you doing something else? I'm just curious, just asking for a friend for me. Okay, so how might we initiate these conversations? So if you've done your market map exercise, again, if you haven't done that yet, check out part one of the series here or just go to smartpassiveincome.com slash toolkit and, and download and get access to Smart From Scratch. That's a full course. Like we, we, that is a paid course that's free right now during quarantine or quarantine. Uh, you are the quarantine. It will come out of the free plan and it will be something we will charge for again. We can only have it be free for so long. Again, we've given away $3 million worth of this course already, but uh, smartpassiveincome.com slash toolkit is where you wanna go. So if you've done your market map, you'll have an idea of the places, right? The places, the people, the products. That's your market map exercise for this industry. So if you are still excited about it and are still curious about it, 
Now you go to those places and find conversations that are already happening. That's sort of level one of understanding what might be of interest to people there. So on forums, in groups, on those websites, in the comment sections, on YouTube, on reviews, on Amazon, there are people who are expressing what they like, what they don't like, what they need help with, what they are struggling with, what their problems are, right? One of my favorite things to do is actually, if you're afraid of having real life conversations, which is always the ultimate goal, you absolutely wanna have real life conversations with people if possible, because that's how you can just better empathize with people, better understand them, uh, so forth. Um, it's just gonna be so much easier to create when you do that. But you can go to forums and groups, and I love forums, like old school forums with threads, or Facebook groups are good too because they have a search bar. I always love looking for the specific terms that help me find out what people need help with. So I'll go into these places, and what I'll do is I'll look up, I'll put quotation mark, happy face, no, just kidding, uh, quotation mark, need help. And when you look up quotation part need uh, quotation mark need help, you're gonna find every thread where people have asked for help of some kind, right? I also uh, like looking up. Um, I want. I like looking up that. What else do I look up? Um, anybody here? That's a good one too, because people will go, hey, anybody here? deal with this before anybody here know how to blank right um so these are different terms that you can use even on twitter instagram maybe not so much twitter is better for more text-based search but these are terms that you can use to find where conversations are already happening related to hopefully these people that you are finding right so that you can find out what they might need help with or where they might be struggling right? These are terms that you can use to go and find and dive into those conversations just so you can get an understanding on the surface level in an online forum where they are comfortable sharing these thoughts with other people like them, what they might need help with. So that's level one. Level two is actually, uh, you know, going to forums yourself and groups yourself and asking around and having conversations. So you are having direct lines of communication with people, but not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. But the ultimate way to have conversations with people is... Um, is, uh, and by the way, question from Francis here, where do you look this up? In the search bar in different places, right? You could even look this up on Google. In fact, if we were to do this right now, just let me see if I can do this on the fly here, google.com. And let's say I wanna go to, um, you know, let's say I'm looking up, let's see, PC game, uh, PC for gaming need help. So if you need help picking out parts, so I'm gonna I'm gonna probably so I'm not in a forum, so it's gonna be a little bit harder. In fact, what I could do is is go forum, uh, gaming PCs, PC gamer forums. Thank you for the super chat, by the way, Karma. Appreciate you. I'll get to that question in just a second. And I'm looking for a search, so I'm gonna go to search here, and I'm gonna look keyword need help, and maybe search titles only. And there's a lot of other things here. I'm gonna see if this pops up. I don't know. Here, need help, need help, need help. I need help building a PC, need help building a PC, need help, old adventure game title, need help, need help, need help, need help, need help. The other one is anybody here? So if I go back to search forums, anybody here? Search. And again, we'll see what pops up. Sometimes you have to join these forums and actually be a member. Other times you might just be able to find stuff like this. So why isn't this popping up? Let's maybe search title. No results found. Okay. That's okay. I want. Let's try one more time. I want to install Windows 95 on Windows 7 PC. Boom. Now I can just you know, write a blog post about that, for example. So just an example, right? But you would play, you would put these into places where people are having conversations. So you could find conversations where people are asking for help. Level two is going into these groups yourself and just asking around. Like if I were to go into a forum related to PC gaming, I might ask a question like, hey, what was the biggest struggle you had when building your first PC? Or a question, anybody building a PC here and struggling, what are you struggling with in particular? Again, I'm not selling anything, and people are more likely to reply if there's no agenda other than just to collect information and see what people have uh, conversations with. See, I said, uh, right there. 
And then number three, the best thing to do is have one-on-one conversations. Now, let me tell you, even though I've been doing this for 10 years, actually a dozen years, 12, do people say a dozen years? That's kind of weird, right? Even though I've been doing online business for 12 years and I have an email list of 250,000 people and have all these platforms where I'm speaking to a load of people all at once, like right here in the live stream, I still make an effort to have 10 one-on-one conversations. Maybe anybody here in the room, I might've had a one-on-one conversation with you. I don't know. I, I pick 10 random email subscribers who had just subscribed to my list and I try to get on Skype with them or on a call with them. So I'm usually gets to the phone because it's just easier. But I try to get to have a conversation with them. 10 per month. These have been, So that's what, 120 per year. These conversations are the most insightful, most incredible, incredible pieces of gold that I've found in my audience because I can ask questions like, well, how did you find me in the first place? That's always an interesting one. But I also ask questions like, what are you struggling with right now? And I hear in their exact words, number one, they're all so blown away. They're like, wow, are you actually taking the time to like learn more about me? Like nobody gets that kind of attention. So this is your advantage when you're just starting out. You can do this to a much larger percentage and population of your audience. I can only do it for 10 people a month. You could probably do it for 100% of your audience perhaps if you wanted to. Imagine the collection of data, information, empathy, stories that you're gonna get with real life people who are, who, who's, who are in your audience. Even if you had an email list of 50 people, have you tried to reach out to have a conversation with them? Why not, right? So I do this with 10 people every single month and these become amazing conversations. And in fact, when I have a new idea for something, I'll often drop it into the chat as well. For example, I might say, hey, by the way, can I just run an idea, uh, an idea by you for something that we're thinking about creating? And people love that because like, wow, you want my opinion? That's really cool. So I might, you know, ask something like, hey, we're thinking about doing this. What, what's your initial thought? What, 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 what's unclear to you about it? Please tell me. And so I'll get right up front from the direct minds of the person who I'm trying to, to solve problems for, my audience, what I need to do better, what I need to do next, all those sorts of things, right? Woo, kind of getting a little, felt like a rant, but it wasn't a rant. <laughs> All right, let me go back up because there was a couple questions and super chats that came in, I think. Uh, let's see, from Karma. Pathlin, you ever work through an empathy map for your markets and customers? There was, this was a game changer for my business. I uh, haven't done an empathy map. Don't know much about it. I sort of just keep track based on the words and um, not necessarily the levels or I don't know what the empathy map is. That might be um, a video you should create and we can point to if you don't have that already, which would be cool. Cool, loving this episode, thank you so much. Amazing. Let's see, how do you use Reddit to growth hack views on your YouTube content without promoting it? Reddit's tough, I'm not a big uh, Reddit user myself. I remember my my experience with Reddit growth came as a result of, on my food trucker website, a post there going viral on Reddit. It was 50 food truck owners speak out, what's one thing you wish you knew before starting a food truck? And that went viral on Reddit. However, when I went into Reddit and I checked the comments, Two of the hundred comments, which were marked right up to up to the top, said, um, "Who are we kidding? We all know Pat Flynn posted this here to promote his brand." I had never even signed up to Reddit before. People were assuming that I went in there and posted it using a different name, which was not true. And I was just like, felt really icky about that. I was like trying to defend myself, and I'm like, "What am I doing here? This like I'm getting traffic and." Two people speak up and they say this stuff like assuming something, and I know it's not true. Like I kind of feel bad for them now. But uh, yeah, that stuff would usually get into my head back in the day, not so much anymore. But uh, that was my only experience with Reddit growth. But I know a lot of people who use Reddit and use Reddit quite well. I think that um, if you can build a cohort of people who can help promote these things for you, that's when it would work out better. I don't know what the best practices are. I don't know, even know if that's possible or if that's, I know it's possible, but I don't, I don't know if that's kosher or not. But uh, yeah, Reddit is, 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 I'm afraid of Reddit, Reddit for sure. <laughs> Luke says, what are your thoughts on building your online platform around general idea like goal setting, writing and doing SEO and building a list, then finding your niche within the list? I wouldn't go down that route because it's gonna be very difficult for, you're, you're gonna get all kinds of people coming in who aren't gonna be quite sure whether or not you're for them or not, right? Imagine you go to a mall, you are a runner and you're looking for a place to get running shoes, but there's all these different kinds of stores, right? Uh, there, there's the walking shoe store, the running shoe store, the athlete's foot for basketball. There's the casual, there's the sort of dress up shoe store. And then you have the more general shoe stores. 
Like you could go to Target and buy running shoes, right? But if you're a runner and you need help with running, where might you go to get a shoe to help you? Um, probably somewhere where you can get some advice to make sure you don't get blisters after you run your first marathon, right? So you go to Roadrunner, which is a, a running store here in San Diego. I don't know if they have them worldwide or, or what, but uh, you know, if you create the general store, you're not going to supply information that will be relevant to people specifically because everybody has specifics. Um, nobody in any audience is a general audience. People have their own specifics and reasons for going to different places, but you can fast forward your way through by picking a target audience. So if you were to you know, provide information about online business and help, I would choose a specific niche and grow outward from there. Because what might happen is number one, you might find that audience and become an expert much sooner, right? I could have created something that was more general for any architects taking any exam for any website, uh, or, or excuse me, for, for any architectural test. But I focused in on that niched one and I could have branched out from there later, but I actually ended up going deeper with that audience, serving them with more information, more products, more programs, more courses. Um, and that worked out really, really well. That's going to be so much easier than starting general and finding a space there because who knows what kind of people you're collecting. Um, and, and you'll have to do that research versus you going, hey, I am the goal setting um guru. I don't want to call you guru though. That's not really a good term, but you know, the goal setting guru for authors. If you are an author, you're going to come to the right place. I'm going to help you, you know, with your goals specifically. And every group, every niche has, yeah, they have goals, but now you can get specific to what those goals are. You're going to speak their language. They're going to be more interested in coming to you. Bernard says, those conversations are really valuable. Chatting with my customers has given me a lot of insight. Yes. So really quick before we finish up here, how do you initiate these conversations? Just ask and say, and you're not selling anything. You don't even know what it is you're selling yet. Again, the purpose of these conversations is to find out what they might need help with, to empathize with them, to hear their story so that when you create something, you know that it's relevant now and it's not just a guess. The whole part of this process during this five-part process here is to remove the guesswork and to always get to a point where you can go, okay, did I get what I need? If yes, move on. If not, go back to the last thing that worked and try again, right? So really, really important for you to understand that these conversations are not selly conversations. These are not selling. We're not selling anything yet. We're having conversations with people so we can better understand them. We are empathizing with our audience. We are going to where these people exist so we can go and see what else we can do. And in fact, the best way to have a real conversation is to start in a social platform if you don't have an audience yet. Have conversations, have people reply to any sort of more general topics or more specific questions that you might have where you're getting reactions and people commenting and reach out to those people individually and say, hey, I saw you reply to my thread here. Um, I'm not selling anything. I would just love to have a conversation with you more about this to understand because I'm, I want to build something that can help people and was just curious if I can get your thoughts on a few things. And then what do you ask? What questions do you ask? Well, I would ask more about, well, what have you tried to do to solve this problem before? What, in fact, are you really struggling with? What else? That's another great question. Well, what else are you struggling with related to that? And have you tried to solve this problem before? How much of a pain is this to you? Um, what are some other questions that I might ask? If you had a magic wand and things were the way they should be in your eyes, describe what that might look like. Oh, if, if things were the way I, I wanted them to be, here, here's what would happen. Um, you know, X, Y, and Z, and then you can write this information down and you can use that information later when you have conversations perhaps with the same person or other people later, you'll know that it's coming from people who are just like them. And that, that's really key. Woo, a lot of good information today, everybody. This was super valuable, by the way. Thanks a lot, Pat Flynn. Yeah, th this was going to be a tough day, I knew, because not just because the intro song didn't play like it was supposed to. I'll go and fix that and figure out what happened there. But simply because this is a tough process. H having conversations with the people is the hardest part of this course, hardest part of this process. But it's so necessary to do. If you skip over this, you're going to be guessing this whole time, and it may or may not work out for you. If you have conversations, you're going to better empathize with your audience, and you're going to have real-life people in mind when you create. And so you're not going to create something that's for nobody. You're going to create something that comes from the people that you've spoken to. So if you haven't checked out part one yet, make sure you check out part one so you can add this on top of that. And tomorrow, we're going to get into a little bit more specific, a little, a little bit more tangible uh, information so that you can and take yourself from this step to the next and we can keep progressing through. So, uh, so thank you so much for sticking with me today and this week and all the time. We're day 61 into this, which is crazy and amazing. And I have all of you to thank for that. Um, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate you. 
And again, over the weekend, we'll get into some more sort of random reviews, YouTube channel reviews, website reviews. Um, but for this week, we're, we're going topic specific, how to create a business from scratch. And again, make sure if you want to follow along and even go further, smartpassiveincome.com slash toolkit. Go to the page where you can get access to Smart From Scratch and you'll be able to see all the course material there that'll walk you through this process for you. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Thanks so much for being a part of my day and uh, check out tomorrow, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. Man, this hour goes by so quickly. Um, keep up the great work. We're going to get there and we're going to get through this together. And so long as we're in quarantine together and as so long as you keep showing up, I'm going to show up for you too. Also, if you haven't checked out yesterday's video, do that. It's getting some really good comments and results. If you are doing any sort of YouTube videos, that's a six step process to make creating videos easier for you. So definitely check that out. Thanks so much. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Appreciate you. Cheers. This is the Income Street help you achieve your dream all while we keep it clean this is the income stream it's the kind of show where you can come and go but then you leave inspired with no fee required the income stream another stupid human with that plan yes this is an ipad but this is high school for me flipping binders anyway i uh, appreciate you so much have a great day and uh, if you could do me one favor take action on one thing that you know you need to take action on that's it Peace out.